J is for Jannah, the garden of paradise. Ha is for Hajj, the blessed pilgrimage. Kha is for Khatim, the seal of the prophethood given to the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala al-mab'uuthi rahmatan lil'alameen. سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this new episode of Ask Zad coming to you live from Zad Studios here in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia Our first question for tonight is for, from Nujban and the question says, is there any recommendation to recite the Qur'an at the time of a person dying? Can reciting help the dying person? Is it true that at the time of death, shaitan attacks with its level best? If so, can reciting Qur'an keep shaitan away from the dying person and ease him to be steadfast in Iman? Now this question is an issue of dispute and it has a number of branches. So at the very end of the question, is it true that shaitan attacks the hardest when a person is about to die? There were stories narrated on such a topic. Among the most famous uh, is the one that Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, may Allah have mercy on his soul, while on his dying bed, he used to faint, and his son Abdullah was next to him, and then wakes up and shouts, no, no, not yet, not yet, and faints again. So he did this a couple of times, and then his son, when he woke up and was conscious, Asked him, oh father, what is it that is making you say not yet, not yet? So he said, my son, did you hear that? I saw Satan biting his hand and saying in regret, oh Ahmed, now I cannot lure you. I cannot deceive you. I cannot trick you because you're about to die. And I'm telling him, not yet. No, I'm not dead yet. I'm not saved yet. Once I die, you have no control over me. But now I'm still uh, 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 alive and I have to be aware of what you might be doing or attempting to do. So yes, this is true that Satan attacks a person uh, the hardest when he's about to die because this is the last chance. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, deeds are by their conclusion. In the sense that you, whatever you die upon, you will be resurrected upon. So if you die drinking wine, you will be resurrected drunkard. If you die in the form of uh, ihram, and you are uh, in Hajj saying labbaik Allahumma labbaik, you will be resurrected on this as well. Coming back to the first question, is it recommended to recite the Quran while a person dying? This is an issue of dispute among scholars. The Ahnaf, the Shafi'is and the Malikis, let me uh, uh, rephrase that, the Hanafi, the Shafi'i and the Hanbali school of thought recommend reciting Surah Yasin. And the Maliki school of thought say that this is not permissible. So who do we choose? Is it the majority, the majority rules? Or is it according to the Quran and to the Sunnah? 
definitely it's according to the Quran and the authentic Sunnah. The three schools of thought that said that reciting Surah Yasin is recommended, they based their allegation and verdict upon weak hadiths in the virtues of Surah Yasin, and none of these hadiths is authentic. And hence, the way we deal with difference of opinion among scholars is that we follow whatever follows the Quran and the authentic Sunnah. And the, the opinion of Imam Malik is the strongest because he has uh, uh, um, the justification for not reciting the Quran. First, the hadiths are all weak. Secondly, it was never done by the Prophet والسلام, and his companions, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Shuaib from the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. How are you, Sheikh? I'm fine. How can I do for you? Uh, Sheikh, I have a question with regards to uh, one of my friends. He narrated the story to me. I, w I said I will, I want, I will ask uh, you about this uh, and to know your opinion. Uh, now, he knows somebody apparently in a Muslim country, maybe in Philippines, and it's a female. And uh, is, I don't know the exact story, but the story is that she has been uh, apparently physically abused by the parents. She had two elder sisters and they were also facing the same issues. They are Muslims, by the way. They live in a non-Muslim uh, country and also in a non-Muslim town. It's a village, not even a proper city, apparently. So it's a very low community, and not many people, they don't know any sheikh over there. They don't know anyone, basically, over there, because hardly anybody is a Muslim over there. So the, the parents are apparently physically abusive. Even the brother, apparently, is into a lot of drugs or alcohol then they physically abuse the sisters and two of the apparently two of the sisters have ran away from the house now this one she i think she's the youngest one and uh, she had been recently again physically abused by the brother he came he was drunk and now she is deciding to in the middle of the night maybe just take the passport and just go because she she does not know what to do uh, then i said listen i I will ask for an opinion what should a woman, if this is really a scenario, and if she is an adult, maybe above 21, what should she do? I mean, should she complain to the law enforcement authorities? Because she's not trust anyone. She does not know any Muslim mufti in that area. It's a okay. non-Muslim term. Okay. Yeah. I will answer. Any more questions? No, that would be all. Thank you so much. Barakallah feek. Brother Shaib from the Emirates is basically talking about an issue of domestic violence and there is an amount of abuse being inflicted upon her and her two sisters who already fled and ran away and she says that her brother is also abusive to her and she doesn't know anyone she doesn't trust anyone basically she is drafting and drawing the only possible solution and answer to her problem, which is just leave. And this is not applicable, Akhi. In a question and answer session, when people ask such questions, we cannot give them simply, yes, leave, run for, uh, for your life, do this, do that. No, this is a serious issue. This woman might be in an abusive relationship with her siblings and her parents. There is a possibility wackos and crazy people are everywhere. It's not only the non-Muslims, also among the Muslims you will have people with brains, if any, brains at all. So we do acknowledge this, but we also acknowledge the fact that there are also not straight girls and boys they can come up with stories with allegations so it is unfair for me as a muslim to hear a story from one side and give a ruling where there is a possibility that this so claiming to be a victim is not a victim if someone comes to you with one of his eyes bleeding and injured, don't judge for him. Wait until you see his opponent.
because he might have poked both eyes. Therefore, I cannot tell you that this sister has to flee and leave. Maybe she is trying not to be committed to Islam. She wants to have a boyfriend. She ha wants to party all night long. And her parents are refraining her from doing so. You're a Muslim. We're a Mus we're Muslim family. You cannot be uh, not permissible. So her previous sisters might have been in the same boat. And they want to party and to have boyfriends. And their parents were probably reprimanding them. Probably her brother was jealous of and ashamed of what they are doing. So maybe he crossed the line a bit, but still she is in the wrong. She drew this upon herself. But if we would like to answer the question according to the data we have, assuming that it is all truthful and there's no foul play, there's no games here or there, in this case, yes. If the abuse is physical and it's harmful see a slap is not harmful sometimes a father may slap his child for reasons reprimanding him or her and this is among his rights he's the father unlike the rules and laws in the west which are totally wrong a father and a mother have the right to reprimand their children within reason and logic, not to leave a scar, not to shed blood, not to break a bone. It's to discipline, not to harm physically. So this is their right. But if they are exceeding that and they are bruising her, they are uh, uh, cutting wounds, they are uh, harming her, Physically, in this case, if, as she claims, she doesn't know anyone, it's about time she knows someone. So she should talk to other Muslim cousins of hers, women, other women in the community. She has to go to the masjid, meet other women, socialize for a week or two, then tell them about her story and try to find a solution with the community to take her passport and run away what do you think will happen? She will be hunted down by or recruited by uh, white slavery mafias. She will be sold as a slave. She will be used as a prostitute. She, what of her religion after all of this? No, physical abuse is better than this fate. But if she can secure a Muslim family, if she can secure someone to marry her who is righteous and practicing and taking her out of that environment, that would be permissible, inshallah. Can she go to the authority, to the police? Yes. If her brother is harming her and she is afraid for her life, she can complain to the police, inshallah. Uh, Maliha says, here in uh, Pakistan, we're taught to offer two nafil with each prayer except for Asr. For Isha prayers, people usually offer four nafil, that is voluntary prayers. What is the ruling of Islam as most people consider them as much obligatory as fard prayers? Well, first of all, I have to raise my hat if I had one on my head. This I cannot raise. But I raise my hat to the people of India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan for upbringing their children to abide by the voluntary prayers. I am always mesmerized, always shocked when I see 13 or 14-year-old kids offering so many rakahs before and after the prayer. And they observe it religiously, not just something that it's a, a habit. They believe that it's a, a whole thing. But my only problem is that not all of it is authentic. Though I appreciate 
how they brought up their children to appreciate Salat and to observe it like that, yet I would whisper in their ears to follow the Sunnah and not to confuse Fard with Nafil, meaning the 17 rak'ah, we pray it at Isha. If you miss two rak'ahs, then the whole Isha is invalid, as so many people write to me. And this is totally baseless. Isha is four rak'ahs. If you live and die praying only four rak'ahs of Isha, nothing else before it or after it, inshallah, you will be in paradise. What level? This is up to Allah Azza wa Jal. But no one can come and say two sunnahs after Isha is mandatory. No, it's not. The man who came to the Prophet ﷺ and he told him, tell me about the religion of Allah. And the Prophet told him about the prayers, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said that there are five prayers that Allah had obligated upon you. And the man said, anything else? The Prophet said, Wasallam, no unless you would like to add extra, meaning voluntary prayers. So the man said, by the one who sent you, I will not add a single thing to what you have just said. So he committed himself to praying only the five fart, two of Fajr, four of Dhuhr, Asr, and Isha, and three of Maghrib. The Prophet said, whoever wants to see a man of the residents of Jannah, let him look at this man. And in a narration, aflaha wa abihi in sadaq. That he has prospered if he commits to what he had said. So this means that thinking that voluntary prayers are mandatory is totally out of the question. Now, having said that, we know that there are 12 rak'ahs, according to the hadith of Um Habiba, may Allah be pleased with her, and others, during the day and night to be prayed with the fard prayers. And these are highly recommended, sunnah mu'akkada. It's known as ar-rawatib. Two before fajr, four dhuhr, two after dhuhr, two after maghrib, and two after isha. Twelve rak'ahs. If you'd like to add a little bit more, you can add two rak'ahs in addition to the two rak'ahs after dhuhr. So you pray four before it and four after it. And if you add a little bit more, you can pray four rak'ahs before Asr. After the Adhan, before the Iqamah of Asr, you can pray two, two rak'ahs. These are four. That is it. What about the four rak'ahs before Isha? This is baseless. The rak'ahs before, between Maghrib and Isha, the four rak'ah of Awabin, baseless. All the hadiths are not authentic. So if you add more, this is up to you. But to say you have to pray two rak'ahs here or two rak'ahs there and it's a must or it's a sunnah without evidence from the, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You and I, how can we invent such things? It's impossible. This is what scholars categorize as innovation, bid'ah. So either follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ or don't add anything to what is mandated upon you. So I hope uh, uh, this answers your question. Fuad says it happens sometimes when we go to masjid and the official jama'ah, the congregation, is already finished. Then we start our own individual prayer and we are in the second rak'ah of salat. Suddenly, a group of people come and form another jama'ah. Now for me, I'm praying my fard prayer alone. Should I continue with my prayer or should I discontinue and join the jama'ah? First of all, you should not be late for the main congregation because all the great and big rewards lie in it. Secondly, if you are, as you've stated, in the second rak'ah and another congregation has just begun next to you, I recommend that you conclude two rak'ah salat, meaning change your intention from fard to voluntary two rak'ahs and offer 
salam, finishing it, finishing it, then you go and join the congregation so that you would attain the reward of your fard salat with the congregation. Our fourth question is from a brother. He says, I want to be a YouTuber making funny videos. Can I use filthy words to make fun in videos? First of all, being a YouTuber is a new hobby that a lot of the, uh, the youngsters are inclined to do. They seek fame and it provides for them this fame. They seek wealth with the ads they post by YouTube. If they manage to utilize it and get more ads, they get more money. And it is something that they find themselves in. However, one has to look at it from an Islamic point of view. Being a YouTuber is nothing haram in it, depending on the means used. So if you post or upload content that is haram, if it has music, if it has women, if it has obscenity or a profanity, a vulgar language, all of this is haram. If the ads themselves, you choose to put them and it contains haram, it is haram as well. Now, using filthy words, this means that you're doing this for the sake of the money. The Prophet ﷺ stated to us as Muslims, the believer is not a person who slanders, who swears, or use profanity. He does not even curse a believer. So now you want to do this in order to be a, a YouTuber. This is haram. The Prophet told us ﷺ that he who says lies to make people laugh, woe to him, woe to him, woe to him. You cannot lie. You cannot imitate others or mimic the way they speak or talk or walk in order to make money or to make people laugh and consider you as funny. So all of these restrictions would answer your question as no, this is not permissible. Abu Yusuf from Saudi. سلامت الله وبركاته. كل سنة طيب كل عام بخير. حياك الله. بارك الله فيك. الله سلامة. كيف حالك؟ حياك الله. شيخ couple of questions. Yes sir. A person used to break the fast in Jeddah after hearing the adhan of Haram كعبة الله. So is it his his fasting in Ramadan was valid or not? The second question is, uh, parents of three sons, one of them middle son, he used to visit them due to misunderstanding of his sister-in-laws that he was doing something to his younger six-year-old daughter, something like that. They discarded, their parents discarded their son upon the complaint of this, their uh, daughter-in-law. So they, they, he's away from them from the last to one and a half decade, something like that. Did they do all right? The son is meeting the brothers. Brothers are okay with each other, but the parents are not seeing them, and he is not seeing the parents. So is it valid? Could you please uh, highlight these questions? And, right. and they, uh, they, do they have any proof that he was molesting uh, his own daughter? No, no, nothing. They don't have the, upon hearing the, the upon hearing the, the daughter-in-law's complaint, that you know, because he was, she was a small kid. She was, she was sitting, laughing, and all that. The uncle, uncle. Usually, children come uh, running uh, and uh, come and sit on the lap of their uh, uncles, uh, having and all that. He was, okay. he was like, like he was a person like that, you know. Okay, I will answer your question, inshallah. Appreciate. Thank you very much. Barakallah feek. We have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminded us through his guidance and example 
that Islam is complete submission to the will of Allah for one who submits a mere declaration or display of belief will not be taken for success but his or her heart and soul will certainly be put to test Allah tested the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam severely in order that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam becomes an example for his companions to follow similarly he tests the believer to see whether he lives a righteous life in accordance with the instructions and commands set by Allah or lives according to what his desires dictate whether the faith he displays is firmly rooted in his heart or is it merely on the surface he will be tested to see whether he will continue to have faith and love of Allah when in a calamity as he does when in comfort whether he will continue to remember and worship him if given bounties and comforts of life as he does when he lives a modest life Allah will undoubtedly test him to see if his faith trust and love of him is unconditional or is it conditioned upon good health and a comfortable life free from stress and anxiety the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed us through his own example that for a righteous Muslim this life is a testing ground where he will continue to be tested until he meets Allah for him tests will be conducted on earth while he lives and not after he dies he knows that as soon as death arrives and he steps into the next world his tests are over there he only receives the result of his tests and enjoys the fruits of the deeds that he committed during a short span of time called life vital knowledge clear explanations and simplified answers about the rules of islam to enable english-speaking muslims to understand islam properly and implement it correctly join sheikh asim al-hakim on ask zed coming live to you on zed tv at the following times our media partner huda tv muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Abu Yusuf from Saudi Arabia asked two questions. The first question was that there was a person who broke his, iftar, his, his fasting, who made iftar when he heard the adhan of Mecca while he was in Jeddah. And we know that the people of Jeddah break their fast three minutes after the people of Mecca due to the distance Mecca is to the east of Jeddah so the sun sets there before us and he did this throughout the month of Ramadan so what's the ruling on his fasting if this person is ignorant and he thinks that Mecca and Jeddah are alike then his fasting is correct if he did this once and he was at the table waiting for the adhan to be called and someone turned on the radio and he heard the adhan he thought that this was the adhan of Jeddah and he ate his fast is valid but if he doesn't have any of these reasons which most likely the vast majority of Muslims know that there is a difference between Mecca adhan and Jeddah's adhan and he yet still out of arrogance he used to break his fast all of his days are invalid and he has to repeat them all again the whole 29 days his uh, second question about molestation so parents having their children and one of their children one of their sons was accused by his sister-in-law so the other son's daughter 
her mother accused him of molesting her and doing inappropriate things. So they cut ties with their son according to her allegation and accusation. So is what they're doing correct or wrong? The answer is that when someone brings you a piece of information, you must verify this. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu in ja'akum fasiqun bi naba'in fatabayyanu. That whenever of a character that is not to be trusted, he's a fasiq, he's a sinful person, and he may relay to you pieces of news and information that are not truthful. Allah says, O oh, you who believe, you must verify first before you take action and at the end of the day regret this. Likewise, this movement all over the, uh, uh, um, the world where if a woman accuses a man, by default, he's an assailant. So if a woman comes and says that this person harassed me or this person raped me, would that make me accused? According to the Me Too movement, yes. But this is illogical. In Islam, it's the perfect system. You accuse someone, you slander someone, you have to either bring four male witnesses to testify that this did happen, this rape or whatever, or the person confesses. Without that, it's baseless. If someone comes to your father and accuses him of raping her, would you accept this? Said, no, definitely not. I know my father. Everybody knows his father. Everybody knows his brother. Everybody knows his son. So in Islam, it's not hearsay. Her word against his. Yes, Sheikh, but she's the mother. Regardless, maybe she has a grudge. Maybe she has some. You cannot tarnish my reputation just because a woman spoke against me. I cannot tarnish her reputation just because I spoke against her. If I do slander her and I say that she committed fornication or adultery and I don't provide the four witnesses, I'll be flogged 80 lashes because her reputation is as good as gold and so is mine. So what the parents did was totally wrong. If there are no circumstantial evidences, no witnesses, and the boy is a good person, they all know that he is righteous, and the girl is young and, 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 and she, she's a child, what would make him do such a thing? And again, without witnesses, they have no right, none whatsoever, to cut their son for such an allegation. Yes, maybe we may take precautions. So this son would never be alone with any of his nieces or young girls, mahrams to him, just to be safe rather than sorry, but not to go to the extreme as of accusing him, convicting him, and then put the prescribed punishment as if he is a full-fledged criminal. And Allah knows best. Muhammad from Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu to Allah. Uh, two questions, Sheikh. Yes, sir. First question is there. If uh, I reach Masjid before Fajr Azam, I have to, uh, I pray to Rakat, Tatil Masjid, and shall I uh, continue praying to Rakat or uh, read the Quran? Which one is the better one? After praying to Hayat al-Masjid, which, which is best to, for you to do? Yeah. To, Have yeah, you to, prayed with her? Uh, with her already prayed at home. Okay. Uh, and uh, the time between uh, when I reach Masjid. So it is a plenty of time is there, Tayat al-Masjid. Then shall I pray it, ra raka, to Raka to Raka or I, I read Quran? Okay. Second question? Uh, second question is the same. When Ada is... Uh, call, oh, sorry, uh, as I call, uh, I will pray sunnah for the fajr prayer. 
then 28 minutes is there for nama, namaz, imam to pray the fajr namaz. Then this 20 minutes, shall I pray two two rakats or read the Quran or make zikr? Which one is the better one? Okay. I don't need your recommendation. Any more uh, questions? No, thank you. You're welcome. I'll answer you, inshallah. Brother Muhammad from Saudi Arabia says that if I reach the masjid and it's like half an hour for Fajr Adhan, so I pray two rak'ahs tahiyyat al masjid in order to be able to sit down. That's clear. Now I have like 25 minutes. What is best for me? To recite the Quran or to pray two rak'ahs, two rak'ahs tahajjud? Definitely, prayer is better. Why, Sheikh? Because while you're praying, you're reciting the Quran. So you hit two birds with one stone. If you just recite the Quran while sitting, you're doing a very good thing. But it is not like reciting it while you are uh, 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 praying. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ used to prolong his night prayers rather than just sit and recite the Qur'an. Because within the prayer, you do uh, the recitation of the Qur'an. As for his second question, now he says, okay, the second scenario is that I am in the masjid. They prayed, they offered the adhan of fajr. They called for fajr prayer. So now, now I stand up, I pray two rak'ahs, raghibat al-fajr, sunnat al-fajr, which is, so important that the Prophet ﷺ had never skipped it, neither when he was traveling or residing. So he always observed it and maintained offering it. And he said that these two sunnah rak'ah are more precious and valuable than the sun had ever shined over. So it is really expensive and, 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 and dear to our hearts, these two rakahs. So he prayed them. Now there are 20 minutes for iqama, for the actual fart prayer. What is it best for him to do? Make dhikr, recite Quran, or offer voluntary prayers? My friend, uh, Muhammad, Offering voluntary prayers between the adhan of fajr and the iqama is totally prohibited. The Prophet ﷺ said that one must not pray between adhan and iqama of fajr except the two rak'ahs of sunnah. It was reported in the sunan that Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, may Allah have mercy on his soul, one of the great tabi'een, was in the masjid of Medina. And a man came in after the Adhan of Fajr, and he started praying two rak'ahs, two rak'ahs, two rak'ahs. Sayyid ibn Musayyib stopped him, and he said, my nephew, as he's an uncle to him, age-wise, this is used in Arabic. So he said, Yabna akhi, my nephew. The Prophet ﷺ had prohibited us from praying between the Adhan and the Iqama except the two Sunnah of Fajr. So the man out of arrogance and ignorance, said to him, O oh, Imam, do you think that I will be praying for Allah and he will punishing me and he will punish me for praying for him? So the guy is using, using his logic now in order to reject the hadith of the Prophet. So Sayyid ibn Musayyib in his wisdom said, my nephew, Allah will not punish you for praying for him. Allah will punish you for going against the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. So many people use the same logic. When you tell them, Akhi, don't pray. This is a time of restriction. He said, subhanAllah, look, look at this ignorant. He is forbidding me from worshipping Allah. Akhi, you're worshipping Allah not according to what Allah has prescribed upon you. Otherwise, when you go and answer the call of nature, why not pray two rak'ahs in the toilet? He said, no, this is haram. He said, is Allah going to punish you for praying in the toilet? Same logic. 
But people don't want to listen, don't want to learn. If you tell them something that goes against what they want or desire, they attack you viciously. Therefore, Sheikh Muhammad, you do not pray anything except the Sunnah of Fajr. Now, should I spend my time in um, reciting the Quran, doing dhikr, or making dua? I would suggest that you try to do a combination. The Prophet told us also that dua between the adhan and the iqama is answered. This is highly recommended. So engage in dua. <coughs> Excuse me. Engage in dua. And after five, seven minutes, all the dua is gone. Do dhikr. Engage in reciting the Quran. Do whatever you find your heart is inclined to. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Uh, Abdul Aziz sent a question uh, before Abdul Aziz, Aqib. Aqib sent a question. He says, can family members and the person whose aqiqa is to be done eat from the sacrifices meat? So we know what is aqiqa, right? Aqiqa is a sacrifice that we slaughter in appreciation and showing our gratitude to Allah Azza wa for granting us an offspring, a child. And this is to be done on the seventh day after the child's birth. So we've slaughtered the sheep, we've slaughtered a ram. What to do with it? Can we eat from it? Or must we give it all to charity? Some scholars say that you should treat it like the udhiya, in the sense that it should be divided into three sections or divisions or portions. One to charity, one a gift, and a third one we eat from. But the most authentic opinion is that there is no specific classification of distributing the meat. What counts is the sacrifice, the, the shedding of the blood for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is what reaches Allah Azza wa Jal. What to do in the meat? You can divide it into three portions and divide it as mentioned with the udhiyah. You can put it in your fridge and eat the whole month from it, you and your family. You can have a feast and call your relatives and friends and eat from it. You can do whatever you wish. The sky is the limit and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Abdul Aziz says, I'm working in a supermarket. I work in the frozen section. Can I touch pork? Not actually touching it, but in the package. I restock them into shelves. I do not eat or sell them. I just stock them. Is this haram? The answer is yes, Brother Abdul Aziz. This is totally prohibited. You as a Muslim are not allowed to come in contact or to assist in selling or buying haram stuff. So even if the pork meat is in, wrapped in nylon or in a plastic bag or whatever, and there is no impurity that would reach your hands, just the idea of assisting, loading and offloading from a truck or stocking it on the shelves or putting it in the fridge, this by itself is haram because you are collaborating with them on uh, a sin which is totally prohibited in Islam. A brother says, can we have two intentions for voluntary fasts, like fasting the six days of Shawwal plus Mondays and Thursdays? The answer is yes. All types of fasting, whether voluntary or mandatory, you can combine with them the intention of Mondays and Thursdays, and also the white days. So if I have a missed day from Ramadan, I can fast it on Ashura and hit two birds with one stone. Expiation of my sins of one year. I can fast it on Arafah. Expiation of the sins of two years, plus making up from, 
for my missed day of Ramadan. I can definitely do it on Mondays, Thursdays, and the white days. There's no problem in that, inshallah. Tanya says, is it haram if we talk about our sins with someone? Of course. The Prophet والسلام, said in an authentic hadith, Kullu ummati mu'afa. All of my ummah, of my followers, will be forgiven. Except al-mujahirun. Except those who do it publicly and declare it. So if you tell someone, listen, uh, uh, last year I did this, I did that. Ten years ago I used to do this and I used to do that. And you expose what Allah has concealed. What's the reason? What's the justification? There isn't any. Hence, a person would not only be sinful, that sin he will be held accountable for because he exposed it. On the other hand, those who commit sins and conceal it, they will come on the day of judgment. Allah Azza wa Jal would put a visor or a screen hiding them from others. And Allah would talk to them one to one. You did this on that particular day. You did this sin on that particular night. And after the slave, the servant of Allah acknowledges it, and he is remorseful and fearful of what's coming next, Allah says, I concealed it upon you in this life. And today on the day of judgment, I will as well forgive it for you. So when you cross the line and talk to people about a movie I saw yesterday, a concert I attended last week, it was so great, so nice, and you're telling others about your sin, Allah will not forgive this unless he wills it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wasim, we put ruqya water at the corners of our house. If there's jinn possession or evil eye or black magic, done on one of the members of the house. The concept of ruqya is there. And we all agree that it is part of our religion. The Prophet said, stated, and he also recommended this. He said, show me what you recite as ruqya. And he said, whoever is capable of helping and assisting his brother by doing ruqya, he should do so. So the concept is there. The ruqya is either done by reciting the Quran and the prophetic duas and the duas in general and dry blowing on a person. And it can be also done on water. You dry blow on water or on the palms of your hands and you wipe over the affected areas. Abu Dawood in his Sunan reported that the Prophet ﷺ recited ruqya on water and poured it on someone. So this, the concept is there. Now, the scholars say that there isn't anything to prevent using this water that we've recited ruqya upon a bit further. So we can drink from it, no problem. We can wash from it, no problem. And we can also put it in the corners of the house if we suspect that there are tough jinn who are not willing to leave after reciting the akar in the house. And it seems that this is, inshallah, permissible. Rania says, can we give sacrifice of an animal when someone falls sick? I heard from a scholar that this is not permissible since it's like bribing Allah. This is not true. We do not bribe Allah Azza wa Jal. We humiliate ourselves, we show our poverty to Allah, and we offer sacrifice. So charity, in general, is a great mean of getting closer to Allah, begging Allah, expressing our need to Allah Azza wa Jal. And there is a hadith that you should cure your patient with charity, but if I recall correctly, this is a weak hadith. Can be possible to authenticate, but the most authentic opinion that it is weak. However, the vast majority of scholars are 
applying it. First of all, because there's no harm in it, there is benefit for the poor, and thirdly, it is a form of worship that you're doing for Allah Azza wa Jal, begging His mercy upon your ill one, and inshallah, there's nothing wrong in that. Muhammad says, if I was praying and I did sujood and got up and I had doubt if I said subhana rabbi al-a'la or not, so I went back in sujood and said it and I did this with several prayers. Are my prayers valid? The answer is, if you were ignorant of the ruling, the, 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 the prayers are valid, but do not do this again. Because if you do it again, your prayers are invalid. Why? If I stood up, I stood up for a pillar of salat, which is the third rak'ah, second rak'ah, whatever. It's a rak'ah, it's a pillar. And if I go back to sujood to say, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, I'm leaving a pillar for an act that is mandatory. This renders your prayer invalid. So what should I do? If you're doubtful, continue your prayer as usual. Don't go for sujood again. Continue your prayer as usual, but then offer to uh, a sujood of forgetfulness at the end of your prayers. A sister says, in my husband's family, they only celebrate when a boy is born. I'm pregnant and now even my husband wants a boy first. Shouldn't they be happy even when a girl is born? What does Islam say these, uh, in these matters? This is human nature. People by nature, the vast majority of them, like boys because they feel that this boy has less problems than girls and he will grow up to assist the parents financially, physically, take care of them, he would carry their name, etc. So this is human nature. There's nothing wrong in that. What's wrong is when you hate that a girl is born. This is mimicking and imitating the disbelievers, the idol worshippers who are uh, um, not liking this. Binto says, if a sister is moving to, the US, uh, to a new state, so basically her question is, can I drive from one state to the other, which is a traveling distance, but with my brother driving behind me in his car so that once I reach my new home, in this new state, he can drive back in his car? The, pro the answer is yes. As long as you are both together, this is considered to be traveling together. Like if a person is traveling in first class and his uh, sibling is uh, uh, traveling in economy. Uh, Mona says, what's the ruling on children watching cartoons? We cannot stop kids these days due to peer pressure. So what's the solution? Well, if your kids come home and say, that we would like to uh, uh, pick up smoking because everyone in the school smokes. Would you allow them? The answer is no. So prevention is good, providing that you provide a substitute. So the current movies and, and, and cartoons like the Disney's and uh, the likes of it, these are all rotten and bad influence, definitely. It's a no-go. You have to look for alternatives that are accepted Islamically, that has a good message and does not have music and does not have any haram things. You have to start uh, uh, to do your homework and inshallah, Allah will make it easy for you. This is all the time we have until we meet, not next week because I won't be here inshallah. The following week, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A is for Allah, nothing but Allah. Ba is the beginning of Bismillah. Ta is for Taqwa, bewaring of Allah. And Tha is for Thawab, a reward. Ja is for Jannah, the garden of paradise. Ha is for Hajj, the blessed pilgrimage. Kha is for Khatim, the seal of the prophethood given to the prophet. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam